<clears throat> yeah, good, good evening, everyone. You are welcome to uh, tonight's um, live session. And this is our project management model. Yes, um, last night we treated um, a stakeholders management, and tonight we are going to treat cost management. And if there is time, we we treat risk management as well. So, cost management helps the project manager estimate what the project will cost and set in place to control by which they can reduce the chances of the project going over the budget. So, which is very, very important in project management. Everything we do, we do in project management revolves around the cost. Once we go over the budgets, we start struggling. It's become a big issue. And for that not to happen, we need to have a proper cost management um, strategy or plan in place to manage our costs so that our, our, our projects will be delivered within the budget. Any, pro any project that has gone over the budget is considered as a failure, although it might not be intentionally bought. When you are giving the opportunity to bring a cost, you have to do a good estimate you do a good estimation before you bring out the cost of the project. If you, if you are given opportunity, attack so many, <clears throat> most of the time, as a project manager, you might not be uh, a present when the cost is being um, decided. So you work on the cost be given to you. But which, whichever is the case, is good to always come up with a cost management plan. So these are the, the processes of um, managing project costs. If you are managing a project cost, the first thing you do is to estimate the project cost. Estimate is not really the actual cost. It's just a rough estimate, a rough figure. Having the picture of what you think that the, the, the project is going to uh, cost. Cost estimation is the process that takes direct cost, indirect cost, and other factors into account and calculate a budget that meets the financial commitment necessary for a successful project. Accurate cost estimation can be the difference between a successful and a failed project. So it's good to, to estimate have, although you've not, um, the, the, the project, you don't know how, but you, you have a plan 
you have a picture of what is going to take you. So when you come up with a good estimation, then you develop a project cost management plan. This plan includes the introductory summary, spending limit, cost variance planning, management approach, reporting process, change control and budget and the project budget. This plan you need to do this um, uh, project cost management plan need to be developed and uh, uh, you need to develop it uh, with the stakeholders uh, making their inputs. So after developing this plan, this this plan is 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 a very big document. I need to be validated, authorized by various um, signatories, and then you start using it to manage your cost, to manage the the project. In so many organizations, if you don't, as a project manager, you don't have this kind of uh, plan. Some stakeholders are not going to be comfortable. They need to see your plan. You need to have know your spending limits within every sector of that project. They need to know how you are going to manage cost variance. If there is a variation, how are you going to manage it? You need to stay the management approach. You need to state reporting processes you are going to use during this, um, uh, during, throughout the time you are managing, you are running your projects. It's a, a weekly reports or whatever, but there must be a reporting process adopted and change control. If there is a situation, there is a change. How do you manage it? What's the control mechanism? And then after then, then you have a proper project budget and you can start managing your project, spending money and that's it. When that is done, the next thing is to track the project budget. You must have a plan within your plan you develop, you use those plans and uh, track your project, your project budget. You must have a standard plan or template to track your budget. To do that, you start by collecting the labor how long each task will take, the hourly rate of each team member, material cost, and all the units of measurement. That's how you are going to be tracking the cost. What is every, what every uh, project member or team member is costing per day, per week, per month, what's every what is the cost of every um every every deliverable how many how long does it, it take to 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 deliver a task or activity or deliverable how much is that going to cost that will help you to know how much you are going to be paying every staff or every 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 team member working with you so you need to have this in plan you don't just start paying so make sure you that your cost if your project is running for one month and you have ten thousand pounds yeah you make sure that that ten pounds that ten thousand pounds 
is allocated within that one month. That will help you to know that at least you can cover the, 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 the duration of the project. And as a wise project manager, you must have a contingency plan. So like if you have 10,000 pounds for one month, when you are planning for your budget, make sure your budget is within 7,000, have 3,000 as contingency. So that if even if anything happened that this project happened to run beyond one month, then you can fall back on the rest 3,000 to cover up. And that's how a good uh, project manager uh, plan the course. And if by chance you manage to deliver the project within one month, using 7,000, then that is a big um, a bonus for the company. And you are going to get um, a raise or a pat at the shoulder for doing that. So let's look at um, the Templates will have for a cost estimation. Under this template is um, a classic template for cost estimation. Classic in that you can use this kind of template both in IT project management, software development, and even um, construction of material project uh, delivery. Now, before you start, you need to break, break your, your projects into phases. Like you see here, you have with this project phase, all the tasks here, uh, second phase, third phase, and you see the ta all the tasks within all the phases. And that's how you allocate labor, this um, unit labor cost per hour. And this is material cost. And this is the total. This is just um, an estimate. Let's call it um, estimation. And that's how you are keep allocating every task. Like if say this task is going to be one week, uh, this phase is going to be one week, maybe every task is going to be on daily basis. So you know how much you are allocating to every task and who is doing that task. It's either the vendor or the contractor, that's how you allocate it. And you come up with a grand total, like here you see grand total, you have um, $77 grand total as a running cost, a budget, estimate for this project. We have other templates we can equally use to do that. Under this particular template, this is for product expense. So under product expense, you itemize the tax or the, 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 the products or the, the material. Then you, you give the description, then you put the unit cost. 
how many units you need. And then um, the, the what a, a unit, the, the cost of a unit times the total units you have, and that will give you the, the total for all the units you need. And that's how you do it within all the items. And then you get the overall cost estimate for this particular project. Then this is for material resources. Then for labor resources, it's just similar to material resources. But instead of units here, we have um, hours. So you check the number of hours times the hourly rate times the number of hours and you get the total expense you need to pay for the labor to do this, um, this job or to undertake this project. So that's how you do the, the estimation under this particular um, template or arrangement. This is called the parametric project cost estimation. Then under this um, arrangement is for this particular arrangement or this uh, template is for IT project cost estimation. Why well, I'm bringing this because mainly what we're going to be uh, doing is um, IT project management. So that's why I kind of uh, want to look at it from the um, IT point of view. Just like other, just like other projects, um, uh, other project uh, cost estimation style, you still need to break the project into phases. So you still need to break the project into uh, phases. And here you state the status of the project because this is going to be an ongoing. When you adopt this process, you are going to be using this uh, particular a document is going to be an ongoing document to manage your cost. And that's why you have status here. So when planning, you continue using it. When it approved, you continue to use it to track your project, to know when the project is in progress, when the project uh, is uh, completed, or when the project is on hold, or when the project is not started. So, and here is the estimated hour pay activity. You need to find out the estimated hour, how long it's going to take to complete a task. And then you come to the associates. When we talk about our social, we talk about the staffs, project team members, professionals that, that 
working within this project um, team. Here you know the number of uh, professionals, okay, the number of hour within a phase. And then you need to, under the phase, start breaking them down. Then you put the, the average cost. And then the associates required a cost. And then that's how you plot all these costs in order to get the total cost. When you plot all these things against the budget you have or the, the, the number of uh, the duration, it will help you to, to find out the amount it's going to take to complete the task. And with that, you are not going to struggle to deliver your project because you've uh, a plan and allocated all the costs before you start the project. And it will equally help you to know when uh, a, a, a tax is completed or when a tax is starting. So, this is uh, how you use this particular um, template to capture your project costs. This is uh, just on a Excel sheet. In real life, we use um, Microsoft Project Plan or Project Planner to capture our our costs. So, and we have other projects. Um, other project planner software, uh, that is Project Labor, just like uh, uh, Microsoft is a free software and that's we're going to be using it to capture our project. It, that is very, it's going to make it very easy for you to capture your cost and they equally baseline your cost. But we are going to come under that when we are going to be uh, looking at the tools we are going to be using in um, project management. But for now, this is how to estimate your cost. Try to capture your cost. Break, you first you create a breakdown structure, the, uh, the, the unit cost, and when you total the unit cost, you get the total cost, and that is how we do it. Or well, this is a, a more conventional approach if you just want to manage a simple project. But if you are managing um, a professional project, we don't use uh, just ordinary template like this. We use software to do that. Then there is another method of estimating cost. And this is called the three point project cost estimation. The difference uh, between this one and the, the initial one is that this particular particular method gives you room for contingency. And I like this particular method because first you, you, you capture the best case, the best case scenario for you to manage this project based on the cost or, or based on the tax. 
then most likely or realistic scenario. And then you capture the worst case scenario. And then you bring the average. And the average is now going to be your cost. So the best case is what the what you, you think that should be best for you. But you need to be realistic because of the market uh, fluctuation, inflation, and the rest of things. So you need to put all these things into consideration. But the worst case is like we know now, like here in the UK, there is high inf inflation just jump. Things, price of things all of a sudden started jumping. For instance, uh, this, um, this um, war, uh, Ukraine Russia war, has affected a lot of things. Price of things skyrocketed because a lot of uh, a lot of goods like uh, 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 fuel, petroleum, gas that comes from uh, this country, um, Russia, and the rest of them. They are no longer coming. It's affected a lot of things. The price of things are skyrocketed. What if you have planned your project before this and you estimated that you are going to use $500 to run this project? And all of a sudden, things change and the price of things jump. What are you going to do? It means you start struggling, but because you have you have made provision for worst case scenario, which is this seven hundred. So if things even happen that way, you are still within. There is no way within the six months of your project, since we just jump from. Um, 500 to, to, to 700. So if you look at it, the realistic scenario would be somewhere uh, 600. So, and after all this, you come up with, uh, this is going to be the cost of either labor or cost of um, material. And when you use it this way, it's going to be, uh, it's going to give you a cushion effect, you know, when things are, are moving very, very fast against your direction. So these are how you estimate. Mind you, this is just an estimate. So it's helping you to, to get the raw figure or how to, to manage your, your project very well. After all this costing, then you come down to this uh, project cost management plan. This plan include the introductory summary, spending limit, cost variance, cost variance planning, management approach, reporting process, change control and project budget. So you come up with a document, a detailed document on, your, on how you are going to manage this um, project. Yeah, I think um, Yeah, so this the this is just the, the table of contents of how this um what is going to be contained within this budget. You have the under the introduction, you have the purpose, and then the documentation and the communication practice. 
Then you have summary statements, reporting requirements, estimate degree requirements. Then you have spending limit authorization level, cost variance action plan. So we have a template we are going to share for this so that you, you don't need to start developing it from the, but you just need to, to understand it. So cost variance, in case there is a variation, this way you detail it. And at the end of the day, you get a, an approval from this document. Approach defined, like approach you're going to use for during this um, cost management procedures, policies, and documentation. Cost estimation process defined. Cost baseline. Work, bring, work breakdown structure of work section and individual tasks. Estimate method. Funding. Contingency stroke reserve. Cost control and metrics, reporting process defined, change control and the project budget. So after documenting all these, then you have, then you know you have a, a project budget that you are going to be using. After doing your estimation, you must have come up with um, a good figure which you show the, 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 the stakeholders and how you are going to, to run the, the, whole, the whole project with your project uh, with your budget plan. So when you have a comprehensive cost management document like this, um, there is no doubt. I think the stakeholders, they must be happy with you. So I have a doc, I have a full template of this document. Let me check if I can share this document. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So this is how the project cost management plan uh, document. That's how it looks. Um, you have all these. Um, just this is what I've just uh, stated, and you start developing them one by one and you have introduction purpose documentation and communication practice overview summary statement reporting requirement estimate degree requirement spending limits authorized authorization level cost Variance action plan, 
approach define procedure policies documentation cost estimation process defined cost baseline estimate method funding contingency plan cost variance and metrics reporting process defined change control and uh, project budgets which is the last thing and you mean after that yeah you, you know that um you've come up with a a cost management plan so in most cases um once you have your project um, plan it covers all some of all these but in some companies where they are thorough they might, might they, um, demand that you you do a thorough uh, cost management plan that's why i'm trying to introduce everything um, to you to let you know everything that's associated with uh, best practice in there uh, cost management but in most cases some of the projects have been we don't use some of these uh, like detailed we cover we capture everything within our um project plan and once uh, the project plan is approved where they check our you see you baseline you you do your cost estimate within the project plan, baseline it within the project plan, and everything is there for them to see, and then it will be approved. But some people want you to document, even after the project plan, they want you to do, have a separate document about your cost management in, in a way like this. So by the time we develop a solid document like this, the only thing left for us to do is to start um, tracking our project, tracking our cost. So, and this uh, brings us to um, project cost tracking. So how do we track? Now we've known the cost, just like everything is at um, is broken down in stages. Under each stages, we see each um, tax activities. And we see we have the, the budget. We already have a budget after our estimation and planning we come up with a project budget so this is our budget and as we proceed within this project we might we might know that the budget is not the actual expenditure when we start running the project you will find out that so but the best plan is for you to uh, run your the project within the budget. So that's why you have the budget and then you have the actual. And then under here, you see either we run under or we, or we run over. So we check <coughs> each activity. Under each tax, we plot it and see how it runs. So we know where we are having problems. Where are we running over the budget? maybe some people are not doing their job on time and because of that we are running over the budget we were able to know those people that are causing us all some people are they are very fast they deliver their 
they are, they are deliverable, they are tasks on time. So you can see that under tasks, you can be seen under here, you see actual, actual budget, actual cost for every task. And we'll be using it, that's how we track the performance. And you can see that this under this project, the budget is $9,700. And the actual cost is um, um, $11,500. So this project is uh, not uh, in good shape. So you can see it here from the dashboard that the actual cost is higher than the budget. So we have a budget overrun. And that is not good. So that is how you we do budgeting and um, cost management in project management. So when we get to um, tools, softwares, we need to we use for project management. Then we'll look more on how to use all these tour softwares and then we'll look at how to use them to allocate um, resources and the baseline of our resources like uh, costs and uh, the rest of them so but for now uh, this is enough uh, to give us the understanding we need to manage our project costing so if you have any question on this, you can uh, bring your question. Okay. Then the next thing we are going to move into is a risk management. Project risk management is the process of identifying, analyzing, and responding to any risk that arises over the life cycle of a project to help the project remain on track and meet its goal. Risk management isn't only reactive, it should be equally proactive. So we know that projects is um, full of risk, you know? When you are managing people, managing money, resources, there's a lot of risk. So, and that's why we cannot, um, we can't run our projects in short, we should start our risk plan, our risk strategy from the day one, starting the project is part of the, um, the key deliverables we need to start with. You must have a plan because your, your risk might start from the first day you are starting or the first contact or your, your first meeting, you are planning with the stakeholders. So when you when you 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 want to have a meeting the, with stakeholders and they don't turn up, then you start having this a risk and time start going. If you if you know your timeline for the project, you need to start meeting and and people are not turning up. These are risks. You must have 
a risk plan, a risk strategy to manage your risk from day one, from the time you are starting that project, you are starting your risk management. Let's look at examples of um, risk. You have project risk, you have operational risk, you have procedural risk, safety risk. Like project risk, you have like going over budgets or taking too long on key tasks. When you are supposed to take to, to deliver a, a particular task within two days and it's taking you to <clears throat> three days or four days, it's a, it's a risk. When you are supposed to, to deliver a tax or deliverable with an amount of um, a budget and you are going over the budget, it's a risk. You have operational risk, disruption to operation or failure in the uh, distribution. You have procedural risk, failure of accountability system or control. We have safety risk, dangerous chemicals, poor lightning or falling items. These are risk. We have human illness, injury or death. We have reputational risk, loss of customers, employee confidence, we have financial risk, stock market fluctuation or interest rate changes. We have technical risk advances in technology or from technical failures who have natural risk, whether natural disaster or diseases like uh, the current pandemic. We have political risk like changing tasks, government policy, and foreign influence. So like now foreign influence is now what an influence like a war that is now happening in a, another country and is affecting people in um, in this country. The, all these things are these are political risk. So, but we're going to although some of all these things that can contribute in one way or the other, but what we are going to focus is on our project risk making sure we deliver our projects on budget and on time. So six steps in the risk management process. The first thing in risk management is to identify the risk. First thing towards resolving the risk is to identify and register the risk and then do a brainstorming with the team on the next step to do. That is analyzing the risk. When you identify the risk, you register the risk. We have what we call the risk register and uh, we have a read log where well, we can uh, log in our risk and then manage it from there. Then analysis, analyzing the risk. You can analyze project risk to address the impact, such as avoiding the risk, owing the risk, reducing your exposure, and minimizing the impact or entirely transferring the risk to a third party. Then we have um, risk prioritization. When you identify a risk and analyze the risk, you need to classify that risk. You need to categorize the risk, prioritize the risk, based on the impact of the risk, such as high risk, medium risk, or low risk. So 
Some risk requires immediate attention. These are the risks that can derail your project. And these are risky, they are very high risk. So when a risk is very high, you, you, you start working on the risk immediately, either mitigating, transferring, or whichever strategy you want to use, you need to do that immediately. Then after prioritizing the risk, knowing where the risk belongs, either high, medium, or low, the next thing is to assign that risk to an owner to manage the risk. Within your project team, you know the best person to, to manage the risk, assign the risk to the person based on the person's or uh, the team member's uh, level of knowledge, based on the expert knowledge within that risk. That's how you, you assign the risk. The person must be uh, somebody who has skills or experience in the risk. That person should be a lead to resolve that risk. Although you'll be working with the, the owner of the risk, having meetings, the person should be reporting back on the, the outcome of how he's managing the risk. But a risk, a risk must have an owner in project management. Everybody cannot be um, managing a risk at the same time. Somebody must be responsible for any risk. Then respond to the risk. For each major risk identified, you create a plan to mitigate on that risk. You don't manage every risk with the same plan. Every risk is unique develop a plan to manage them based on their uniqueness. Develop a strategy, some preventive or contingency plan. Work with the risk owner to decide on which of the plan you created to implement to resolve the risk. So when you've created a plan to mitigate on those risks, then the next is to keep monitoring the risk. Whoever owns the risk will be responsible for tracking the progress towards resolution. But you need to stay up, updated to have an accurate picture of the project's overall process to identify and monitor new risks. Having regular read meeting is a good way of uh, monitoring risk. So read log is very good because read meeting is a, is a statutory meeting in project management. And that's why it's very good in managing risk because it's a statutory meeting. It's a meet, most in, in most of my projects will have read meeting once every week. It helps to, to look at the risk we are managing and then look at the up, upcoming risk, seeing if you can identify any risk. So when you are managing, when you are having a, a meeting on a weekly basis to resolve risk, identify new risk, close risk, so with that, you find out that the project is going to be healthy because before any risk comes or develops to a big issue, you people must have uh, developed a plan to mitigate um, against that particular risk. That is the best approach to manage risk all these uh, six steps. When you apply this step in your project, then you are going to get a good result in terms of risk management.
So let's look at um, how to respond to risk uh, a bit in details. So responding to, we have uh, now maybe identified the risk, now time to start responding to risk. How do we respond to risk? We have avoiding the risk, transferring the risk, mitigating the risk, or accepting the risk. So these are various strategies on response to risk. Risk avoidance. It's usually involved changing in the project plan as uh, such as extending the schedule, reducing the scope, spending money or hiring um, resources to eliminate the risk. So that's how we avoid the risk. We can extend the, 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 the schedule in order to accommodate, um, avoid this risk or reducing the scope of our project. If the scope is, we can reduce the scope, making sure that that risk is not contained within the, the project we are managing. We can equally spend money on hiring resources to eliminate the risk. Can, can get a, 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 a more um, professional risk analyst. That means hiring resources. You can get a, a risk analyst that will take over and uh, manage the risk. An example is when you hire a more skilled resource, when it's likely to get a uh, has done in less time. If in your, in your project, you find out that um, most of your, um, the, for instance, in um, software development, you find out that the software, the developer is not competent enough to do the job and you've spent a lot of money hiring the developer, you are not going to stick to the developer uh, because um, you've already paid some of the money, you're working with the developer, you just, you don't manage. All you need is you spend more money and get um, a more skilled developer that will do the job. And that's the only way you can avoid your project um, failing entirely. It might cost you more money, but you get, at the end of the day, you get results. So hiring a wrong person is already a risk. So the only way to get such risk uh, sorted out is hire more competent hand. Risk transfer. How do you transfer risk? Sharing the risk with someone else. It is simply handing off the risk to another team, organization, or entirely third party. You can outsource your risk. There is um have um um debt collectors well they are professionals when you find out that um, in your project that you are you are struggling recovering some of your some of your funding or some money in organization 
So money might have become a bad debt. So losing the money entirely, you can hire um, debt collectors to go and collect the money, although it, it will cost you more money, but you at least not going to lose everything. You can equally transfer the risk by buying insurance. And that is the one of the best way of uh, transferring risk. Most companies, they insure all their, their staff, all their vehicles. And these are how they transfer the risk. If, 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 if a staff have an injury within, um, within a workplace, that's going to cost a lot of money. If you didn't insure your staff, injury lawyers can, can, can make a lot of money out of the organization. And that's why <clears throat> they make sure that they transfer such risk to a third party by making sure that they insure the staff or the workforce. In some construction sites, if you are not in, uh, insured, you can't even enter the sites. And that's how severe it is. Then we have um, risk mitigation. How do you mitigate a risk? It involves carrying out work now to reduce the uh, probability or impact of a risk to be within the acceptable threshold. It may include preventive, detective, or testing possible ways to reduce the risk. And the example is backing up data to a to an off-site location. For, for, for those who knows what the um, cryptocurrency is, everybody knows that cryptocurrency is a very risky business. Even for those, um, the customers, that is the end users, and not only them, even the companies providing the cryptocurrency services. Not only because of the price fluctuation, but when such, uh, um, when there is a cyber attack, you can lose everything within uh, a short period of time. And in order to reduce the risk, it is better to, to have a backup, like what we call crude wallet. You store most of your uh, currencies in crude wallet, not in hot wallet, where cyber attack cannot, um, or hackers cannot reach them. You know, so many companies like um, Amazon are having a, a, a lot of valuable data. They don't just leave their data in one, they have backups. So in IT, the number one thing to, to, to mitigate risk is having good backup. All your data, you back them up in an off-site or even offline. So, so that if anything happen, you can easily recover and get back to operation. And then another example is choosing a more stable supplier. It might be uh, costly to work with uh, some, but it's worth it. It's better to have a stable supplier that you can uh, trust than having someone you can have good price, but 
It's not the, the supply might not be stable. So you don't, you, you, at times you look at the risk involved and that's it. Some people like, for instance, importing goods from China, from somebody you don't know, can be a big risk. Instead of doing that, you can choose to be important to buying goods from local, local suppliers. It can be costlier, but it's more, uh, it has more risk, um, low, it's, it's a low, lower risk strategy because you can easily visit your supplier if their supplier is locally within your country. But if everything is online, you don't know the person or you can lose everything. Your, your, your goose can even um, sink within the sea. So these are ways of uh, mitigating um, risk. Then risk acceptance. You find out that you've been trying every strategy either to avoid the risk or transfer the risk or mitigate the risk. But at the end of the day, the trap eventually hurts you and you are in. And the only way out is for you to accept the risk and deal with it. So you find out there are some risks you just need to accept. And acceptance, an acceptable risk is the one that is tolerated because there is nothing you can do to prevent or mitigate it, or it is costly, or it is difficult to implement. One of the common acceptance strategy is to come up with a contingency plan to cope with its consequences. So some of these risks can be the timeline, project timeline. Something can just happen and find out that there is no way you can finish this project within this timeline. And once this project goes beyond six months timeline, you don't have enough budget to pay your workers. So, what do you do? You make contingency plan. Just like I said from the beginning, if you have 10,000 pounds for this budget, first plan your, your, your project within 7,000 and leave um, 3,000 in your reserve. So if something like this eventually happen, you know you are going to have something to fall back on to continue and finish this project. So these are ways you can accept such risk and deal with it. And because you have a, a plan, contingency plan, so that's the only way you can cope with the consequence of such a, a risk. So, now we have uh, controlling the risk. This means improve the efficiency of the risk analysis process. When controlling the remission, your risk analysis process or strategies is, uh, is, is good. And not only that, you keep on improving on the strategies on your risk analysis process or strategies. Involve monitoring and reassessing risk over time. Keep identifying new risk. Evaluating the effectiveness of the risk response strategies. Performance information should be reviewed regularly, like having regular meetings and the costs incurred. You keep on having 
regular meeting like using um like i said earlier using red meeting to keep having meeting and meeting regularly this is a better way of controlling your risk because you can help you to keep monitoring your risk identifying new risk logging new risk so that's how for me once i have good rate plan i'm good to go with my risk to help you keep planning and monitoring and evaluating and identifying new risk you know so that's how i do risk control so risk and risk response plan should be reviewed in regular meetings just like i said in red to ensure plans are being implemented in this meeting key risk should be given more attention and new risk should be raised and discussed so and i said red is the for me the best approach to control risk because you help you to keep having regular meetings and when you're having regular meeting you keep looking at the upcoming risk and then keep on managing the, the other risk, closing risk, even some risk that is not well uh, managed, you can reopen the risk and deal with it the way it should be. So at this point, we are going to uh, move into red. Red which is a risk, assumption, issue, and dependencies. That is read. R starts for risk, and A for assumption, and I for issue, and D for dependencies. Serves as a central repository for all the activities within the project. It keeps track of everything happening in your project. It's a, it's, the red log is a very powerful document because it deals with everything that can uh, derail your project. A good practice is to create a red log at the beginning of each project then regularly review and update it as necessary through regular project meeting. Active RAID meeting, active management of the RAID log element is one of the key roles of the project manager. So is the role, the, uh, your, your responsibility as the project manager to make sure that you create your red log and have your regular red meeting to capture your, your risk, to capture your issues, capture your assumptions, and capture your dependencies. And then manage them on a regular basis. So and when you most projects, red is a statutory meeting. It's not a one-off meeting. It continues till the the project ends. Even if you are not doing most have read in every every week. Even if you don't have any dependent any any other meeting within to do in the week, it's very necessary that you come up to look at the upcoming risk and how the the existing risk uh, is progressing in terms of uh, mitigation. Read assumptions. We already know what uh, risk it means. So we'll look at assumptions in red. Assumptions are those factors in project that are considered to be true without providing evidence. We don't have any evidence. We just say that consider it to be true. Something that can happen within the project, but we don't have any documentary evidence. You can just search 
um, factors or such uh, assumptions, we document them in read under assumption. Though we don't have evidence that such things are ha will happen or happening, but we document them. They are taken for granted, but can be uh, cannot be guaranteed and may impact the result of the project. And that's why we have to document them. Although we don't have any documentary evidence that such issues or maybe negative issues or whatever will happen, but you cannot take it for granted. You just document it and then monitor them. Example of uh, assumption is uh, staff availability. You know, staff staff um, unavailability. If we're having short of staff, you, when you start a project with a group of um, uh, team members, we all expect that. Uh, if we have 10 project team members, the assumption is that these 10 project team members will work together and complete this project. But that's a, that's assumption that we are going to have, we we'll have a, uh, enough team members. But along the line, one of the team members, maybe even the most competent, can get a higher offer somewhere and just abandon the project. And that will lead us into risk to we'll start struggling. So when we are talking about assumption, we just can say that staff availability can be assumption because anything can happen, although we have enough, but we can't see. So assumption analysis will be allow questioning the assumption. We keep on revisiting and monitoring it. Help discover problematic assumptions like this uh, staff availability. Um, assumption in the project is assumed that um, if we have six months to complete this project, it's assumed that we are, we are going to finish this project in six months. It's an assumption. But there is no evidence that it must fit, we, we must fit, this project will end well within six months. We have assumption that, uh, yes, we have enough, um, enough, um, enough funding to complete this project. But it's still an assumption because we can you don't know until so the, all this can come on under assumptions. We keep monitoring them because anything can come come up from those areas. So these are things we keep under assumption within our read log for monitoring. Then on that read, we have issues. These are unanticipated incidents that cause the project to become out of um, alignment. This occurs during duration of a project. It affects the project's specific goal, cost, or shadow, they are risks that have already happened. And failure to manage issue may result in poor delivery of the project or even in failure. So issues are the risk that has happened. When we are seeing a risk, is, risk is something that might happen that way um become bring a um, negative impact to our project and that's why we start struggling to either transfer the risk so that it will not happen or avoid the risk or within all this our strategy you see all these things to make sure that this risk don't happen 
But after everything and the risk happen, then it becomes an issue. And then what do we do? We deal with it. So we quite have a way of managing it, mitigating it. That's, that's what mitigating an issue that happened, like uh, accepting the, the, the risk, well, because it has happened. You can't avoid it anymore. Then we have dependencies. Dependencies are those activities which need to uh, start before or be completed in order for the projects to proceed successfully. Like if you are working with a waterfall, most of the activities in waterfall are under dependencies. And that's why we call it waterfall because it has TP, um, it's TP in nature that you must finish one activity before you start another activity. Like in, in, um, in, um, in water, in waterfall. You must do your, for instance, uh, stakeholder management or, or risk analysis, or stakeholder analysis uh, before you, you, you start um, a requirement gathering. So because you, if you don't do your stakeholder analysis, you might not understand the, stake, the, the stakeholders you need to engage during requirement gathering. So it's, an activity that depends, you find out that a lot of activity depends on, on the other activity. You need to complete one activity in order to step another activity. And one, when one activity is delayed, then you are delaying other activities. It becomes a chain reaction. And when you are having issues with one activity, it can spill over other activities. So that's how, that's why it's very, very important that um, you document all the dependencies, all the dependent activities or factors within a project to monitor them, make sure that they are, everything is working accordingly, monitoring that because you find out that Every, they are depend, they are, most of the activities are dependent on each other's. And when we're having problem in, with one, the knock-on effect will be on the other activities. So you document them to keep track of all the dependencies within the project. Then what are the benefits of this uh, red log? It ke helps keeps your project organized and on track. Makes the information easier to store and to retrieve. It's very useful document in regular project meeting and for all these purposes. It gives you confidence gives confidence to all project stakeholders that the project is under control and being monitored. It allows to engage with upper management and ask their help. When you're having read, read meeting is a meeting that even other stakeholders can join, not only the immediate team members. Other stakeholders can join to, to, to be part of the risk, to monitor or to see the risk uh, being identified. And within that, it's an opportunity to engage all these stakeholders. They can start making inputs on helping you, the project team, resolve or manage their, their risk. So it's a very useful and um, a very useful 
uh, strategy and techniques in project management. So this is um, an example of uh, a read log dashboard. The dashboard is a way to summarize all the logging, allowing um, all the logins, allows project team to review all relevant information related to the project at a glance. So almost all the red logs have um, this kind of dashboard. And dashboard will help you once you look at the dashboard you will understand how healthy the pro you don't need to start flipping through so many pages to start searching to monitor to once you just look at the dashboard you see how healthy the project is when you look at the bad dashboard and you see that most of the uh, um activity within the raid is under critical condition like you can see you have like 10 uh, five critical risk within the pool we have a lot of critical assumption issues and dependencies so you find out that the project is really in a very bad shape so we use a prioritization like a critical, high, moderate, low, negligible to rate the impact or the severity of a risk or assumption or issue or dependency. And you can see now we have one critical issue. We have. Um, one high, one critical risk, one high risk, no, mod, no moderate risk, no low risk. No, so we have two risks that needs urgent attention. And that is uh, the importance of uh, this um, red um, dashboard. Very soon we will share the, the template of this full read and you see how they look. Very important document. Yes, Mr. Um, Isaac. Hello, Mr. Isaac. Okay. Then the, we have um, the read, read documentation, how read looks like. When you are documenting um, issues or risk or assumptions or dependencies in read, the first thing is uh, you categorize categorize the item under is either issue or is either uh, assumption or risk or you categorize it under this way and then when you categorize the issue you describe the item or the issue or the risk then you give the impact the impact of such activity or issue or risk, then you assign the owner, assign the, assign the, the issue, either the issue or the risk, you assign it the owner, and then you prioritize it to know the severity. Like here we have a vendor master data is outdated. Yeah. 
the impact is not stated, but to have the owner here, AN, and is low. So it's outdated. All we need to do is to update the vendor master data. So here we have the absence of procurement policy. It can be negligible, but it's still an issue when you, 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 you don't have um, a policy on your procurement. That's not a good one. Then assumption. Information is available through the approval process. It's an assumption. But the risk here is, which is very critical, is that it takes long to meet supply by the delivery people. So long supply delivery, which can be um, very difficult. So if the delivery is not made, is not being done on time, it can cause a lot of uh, confusion. The, the, the company can run out of stock. So in this scenario, so this is how to capture issues, risk. Well, so when you find out in a project you are managing, that is like, for instance, say you've tried the delivery people, the, the supplier to wise, and they keep telling stories. The first time you try them, they didn't supply on time. And yeah, you capture it immediately. And when you find such a situation, then the next thing is to assign, you assign it to end to dig, it is critical, and maybe to look for another supplier that will be reliable. So this is how we capture incidents and then log them within the read log and monitor them. So, and the only thing that um, is remaining this and uh, this uh, read, which I need to add is on this thread, we need to <clears throat> show the, the status of the read, whether the read is, um, is open, whether it's closed. So any read, we need to know whether it's closed because once you resolve an issue or you resolve, a, you resolve a risk, when the risk, a risk is captured, it will remain open. So we need another column where we put the status. So when the read is, um, you capture the, the, the read, the, the incident, it will remain open until it is resolved. And once it's resolved, you close it. So when you come in a read like this, you find out that most of the read here, they are all open. Then you know there is a, there is a situation. It's very, very dangerous. It's not, um, it's not good for the project. So that's how we capture our, our risk using read log. There are so many other so many other tools you can use to manage um, project. There are so many of them, but I pick read because it's one of the uh, the most popular tools out there. Every almost everybody, every company uses read. And once you have a good read management, or good, you find out that there is no need of because it gives you everything you want and they help you to manage it very well. So that's um, all we have about uh, risk management. And this is where we uh, we stop for tonight. And I'm open for your questions now.
Do you have any Okay. Um, yeah. Oh. Hello? Yeah, I'm with you. Hello? I'm with you. It's uh, Mr. Okay, I want to know. Good evening, Mr. Mr. Isaac, I'm with you. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Okay, I want to know if under the red log, I want to know if there's a particular format to determine when the risk is high or low or moderate or negligible. Is there a particular format or how do we determine it? Yeah, you determine it. That's why you have um, you have um, you have a red meeting where every team members and even high level stakeholders join. You determine the severity of the of the risk through brainstorming. You understand what I mean? Yes. Well you, you your project team and the stakeholders who are doing red meeting, you look at a risk, you analyze it, you discuss about that risk. You look at very option, the impact of that risk, what that risk can cause. You look at very uh, available, every factor surrounding the risk. For instance, if you are looking at, if that risk have the capacity to, to derail that project, then you know it would be so you use uh, like I say brainstorming. Brainstorming is a very powerful uh, approach in project management and business analysis. You brainstorm as a team. Everybody bring ideas. Look at uh, look at it from. So when you are brainstorming, like for instance, all of us here in this uh, meeting, we are 20 and we are brainstorming on an idea. So it means that we are looking at this particular idea from diff from 20 points of views. And everybody will start contributing. And at the end of the day, we come up with the best idea on how to grade this particular uh, incident in our rig. And that's how we then prioritize it, give it that, that this risk, um, this particular risk should be classified as high risk. We agree that it's going to be high risk. And then we we'll decide based on our plan on how to manage it. We we'll look at within our team here, who is the best, um, who is going to be the owner of this risk based on the wealth of knowledge everybody's having. You look at, uh, you say, okay, this is um, um, a health and safety related issue. This is chemical spillage or whatever. And uh, some of us doesn't have uh, expert knowledge on uh, health and safety. So we say, okay, uh, Mr. Isaac, you own this particular risk, you become the owner. So you help us use your expert knowledge to then address it. And uh, all of us, we are not going to leave it for you, but you are going to be leading in mitigating that risk. So there is no, the, the, the way, the only way to do that is, uh, like I said, is brainstorming. We keep analyzing it against how the effect, the impact. So the impact evaluation, we do, uh, we do impact analysis. Impact analysis is how negatively or positively that particular incident can uh, uh, be impacted on our projects. Doing, uh, do using impact analysis, if we see that it have the capacity to derail this project, then it's a serious matter. And that's how, but if it's just like um, uh, the risk, maybe one of uh, one team member falls sick, 
Yeah, we can capture it and you know, capture it as a risk, but we can say it cannot be severe risk because the we are hoping that the team member will recover soon and join us and we'll be doing more of um, overlapping, covering that particular team member till the team member comes back because he's sick and hope he's coming back, but depending on the kind of sickness. But when a key team member is leaving that project team, for instance, one of our uh, key and experienced business analysts is leaving, uh, it will be very difficult to cover such person. It's a big risk. And the only way is to work hard and get another uh, competent business analyst. Because when you have a, an experienced business analyst with all the wealth of knowledge going, it's going to be a big blow to the project. So that's how we classify. So you can see there are the other person, the, the, um, and uh, a team member is sick, and that the team member is leaving. They are two different things. So if you need to classify two of them as risk, you cannot classify two of them as the same, because one is sick and he is going to come back, depending on the kind of sickness. And the other one is certain that the other person is leaving. So we need a replacement, and it might take time to get a good replacement. If you are if you are a hiring manager, some of us we don't know what these hiring managers see. It's not easy to get a competent um, to fill a particular role. It might take a week, it might take a month, it might even take um, uh, four months. You might get someone who might sound so well during the interview, but when the person starts working, find out the person does not really have uh, the kind of um, skill that you, the person has beaten during the interview. And you start afresh to start looking for the, another um, professional or expert. So that is how you classify and prioritize risk. I say brainstorming and um, and the uh, impact assessment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Um, in the, if you don't have any more question, like I said, we are, we are stopping in um, this uh, risk management tonight. So, and the next thing is uh, we might be having um, a slight, a slight assignment just to test the microphone. And so, but as soon as the assignment is in the in the portal, I will let you know and you check it out. Is that okay? It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Well, I thank you. All right. All okay, right. sir. All That's right. Okay. Well, thank you for <laughs> thank for you join, for joining, and I will see you next week. Uh, we we'll have the assignments within the week. We can be we'll be collaborating. We'll be collaborating, communicating. But the next live session will be on Monday and the timetable will be out. All right.
Okay, yeah. sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.